The following program is rated TVMA. This program may contain strong opinions, explicit language, and possible adult themes. The opinions expressed are not necessarily those of the Smoke Free Radio Network or its affiliates. This program is meant for mature adult audience. Viewer and listener discretion is advised. Hey folks, P. Bissardo here, and you're listening to the Smoke Free Radio Network. Evening, everybody. Mike Peterson coming back together with another edition of Vaping in the Mic. A little bit of a different format this evening. Typically, we've got things just on a one-on-one and maybe a couple of people. But this evening, this evening at the last minute, these things fall together really nice. And these guys were were just outstanding to be able to come with me. I've got three people. (laughs) We're all going to be kind of crammed into one screen. Um, But I've got James Jarvis. I've got Sherwin Mena, and I've got Mark Bird, and we're going to be talking about a few different things that are near and dear to everybody's heart. There is no doubt about that. We're going to cover uh, T21. Mark's Mark's working on a few things with the Vapors Carnival. I've got Sherwin that has some things that he wants to talk about taxes. James is James is always in there for something brand new, so there's no doubt about it. So if you would, everybody... Please welcome all these fine men here. How you doing, gentlemen? Doing great, man. Doing good. For How the people you? that for the people that are not aware, uh, on the screen that you're looking at in the upper left hand corner is Mark Bird. There's me up in the upper right hand side. Down on the bottom left, we've got Sherwin Mena, and then we have Mr. James Service, Mr. Technically Challenged, over in the right hand side. <laughs> Thank you. A fresh face. Yeah, and this clean-shaven face. Now, I'll tell everybody the same thing that I said when I was talking with these guys. It turned around, and I was Bill Tarling had looked at the part that you had done, uh, the promo that you did, Mark. And he goes, Mike, he goes, you've got 30 minutes to grow a full goatee. And all of a sudden, <laughs> in comes James, Mr. Clean-shaven. It just That blew that all to hell. Now, I've got a little bit. I ain't got much of one, but... Now we've got an assortment. The, these gentlemen, I'll tell you what, individually, outstanding as a group, this this will be a lot of fun, um, and all of them trouble. There is no doubt about it. Don't let them fun. fool you. We're all fun. Oh, yeah. Fun guys. Uh, I like to fuck shit up. Very first thing. That, <laughs> <laughs> very first thing I want to talk about um, Mark, you have the Vapors Carnival coming up in Oklahoma City on the 25th and 26th. Is that correct? And 27th. 26th and 27th. Okay. The last weekend of the month. Yep. Tell me if you would, and for people that are watching, they might not have known previously, (laughs) what is the difference, the main difference between other expos and yours? Because it's a huge difference from the way I look at it. I think primarily the um, uh, the biggest difference is our focus on smokers and um, and advocacy in general. Uh, we try to participate in all of the advocacy organizations um, that we in, in states where we do business. Uh, the North Carolina Vaping Council, Breathe Easier Al- uh, Alliance of Alabama, the Tennessee Smoke Free Association, and now the Vaping Advocates of Oklahoma. Um, uh, it's a big part of what we do. Um, is uh, to both raise uh, awareness and funding for um, these groups who are struggling right now to ensure that vapor businesses have a future in this industry. So, you know, we try to do our part. Well, you definitely do your part. And 
it, I, having been in a couple of different expos um, from various promoters, you know, I did um, Vapor Slam, which was up in New York, and that was Freeze Winfrey, and that that was a an educational moment all by itself. And right. then Midwest, no. and then able to do the Vapors Carnival down in Chattanooga this last summer. And just for me, I noticed a difference between every expo is going to be a, a different look, a different feel, a different vibe. And right. yet, your show was so laid back. Other shows, they, they've got this tension, this hype running around. Right. And your show, people are walking around and looking at each other and going, wow. And then you have this traveling carnival menage of people that come walking around. Right. And that just flips everybody out. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think it's it's a it's a good time, you know, uh you know, we the 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 perspective shift is is intentional. You know, we try to include uh our exhibitors in, you know, with with what we're doing. We try to include the state groups, we try to include the local communities. Um and I think that they respond to, to that very well. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I don't know about, you know, the other expos and what they do and so forth, but I know that for us, you know, it's very important that, you know, we, we have a, a small footprint in the communities that we're in, you know, and a part of that is developing relationships with the business owners in the area, um, you know, answering any questions that they might have, you know, and just communicating with them, make them feel involved, really, um, you know, make them feel like this is a part of their you know, this is a part of their community too. You know, this isn't just a business. This is a, you know, kind of a, a um, an idea that you can, you know, you can get out in the community and in a grassroots way, you know, uh, affect smokers where they live, you know, not, you know, it's kind of confusing oftentimes when you go to a vape shop, for example, and they start talking about, you know, coils and ohms and amps and ohms law and, you know, battery safety and all of these things that, you know, can confuse and be an obstacle to the, you know, to the introductory smoker. Um, you know, our event, we have um, a starter kit sponsor in Oklahoma City. It's going to be Aspire Vape Co. Um, they're going to be providing uh, Breeze 2s to people, but also not just the kit. They don't just give them a kit. Um, they educate them on the device safety, make sure that they know how to, you know, change their coils out because especially in these refillable pod devices, sometimes they can be finicky and, you know, and oftentimes if something is really confusing or, or too technical, it's kind of an obstacle or barrier to entry for, you know, for, for a person that really just wants to quit smoking, mm -hmm. you know, they, they don't care about the, you know, the cloud chase. I mean, it's fun, you know, all of this stuff is fun and it's in interesting to look at and, and and so forth but but really what they're there for is to either quit smoking or to continue staying off of you know cigarettes i mean really that's what it's all about that's um, why this that's why this convention is so crucial to this industry right now you know uh mark and i talked and, and i was extremely <clears throat> ecstatic to be a part of what what he was just talking about with the uh the show sponsor and being uh, one of the the smokers ambassadors you know it's 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 going to be amazing to take people that are just getting into this in a setting that's not threatening, that's not making them a little bit nervous or gun shy about coming into a vape shop. There are people there that want to help them make the switch, that are going to be educated. And it's our chance to shine and show them what the industry is really about, why we're here in the first place, and hopes that they will bring you know, success to them and then they'll bring people back to continue going. If we don't grow this segment of this industry the right way, like, like Vapor's Carnival is doing, we're not going to be here. And a year from now, we don't have to worry about the FDA putting us out or the taxes in the states. This industry is going to smother itself from the outside in if we don't bring in new people. And this event right here is the prime example of the way that we need to go about business in this industry to bring in new customers and people that are wanting to get off of tobacco and change their life. That's exactly right. And you can't, you know, you can't, you can't come at them from a doom and gloom, you know, like kind of like attitude you can't come in all militant and make them feel bad about everything you know <laughs> they're not going to respond to that you know and or you know you can't bring them into some elitist atmosphere where you have you know people who are who are not inviting who are not welcoming um to you know the average you know old lady you know that you know just wants to quit smoking you know and and we've tried to encourage an environment where those people 
are are not only invited and welcome, but they're treated, you know, better than any person at our show. They get, you know, hand walked through the event. James Jarvis has um, actually agreed to be a part of that program and kind of um, work with the smokers and make sure that if they have questions, that they're being directed to the right places. Um, oftentimes we, we have misinformation spread like wildfire. People have questions and, you know, when they're being inundated on television by all of these, you know, these just threats, these horror stories, you know, it's like, <laughs> oh my God, I don't know what to expect. Well, you know, people have answers. I may not have all the answers and, you know, that I definitely don't have all the answers, <laughs> but that's why we focus on advocacy because those guys do have the answers. And part of what we do is direct any kind of regulatory questions or health questions or any kind of questions like that over to the groups like CASA, um, the VTA, SAFADA, the North Carolina Vaping Council, the Vaping Advocates of Oklahoma, you know, the Tennessee Smoke Free Association, they know what the, you know, what's going on in their states. They know what's going on on a national level, um, which is also why we just joined the VTA. As a matter of fact, we joined the VTA because we wanted to put our money where our mouth is. You know, um, we have uh, I saw a video and it was about a guy who was talking about the word responsibility, you know, and and he said that, you know, a lot of people look at responsibility as obligation. But that is not what responsibility means. Uh, responsibility is your response is basically how you respond to your ability. Basically, um, do I have the ability to affect you know change on a national level? Um, not by myself, but I have. I can give some money. <laughs> you know, I can't go sit in front of senators. I don't know the law. I'm not going to be in front of. You know, these guys talking about, you know, stuff. That's not me. That's not my place. Right. But I can give them money to the professionals and experts who know what they're doing, um, who have, you know, shown us that, you know, that they have a plan, you know, that they're implementing the plan. Um, and, and one of the main reasons that we join is this 50 state joint defense strategy that they have proposed, which is basically where they are helping state groups like, um, the North Carolina Vaping Council, the Ohio Vapor Trade Association, and other states um, with lobbying efforts, you know, funding for lobbying efforts. You know. <clears throat> we all got to help, you know. So my response, I had the ability, what was my response? Now, let me ask you a question, Mark. How long did you ponder the move to join the VTA as an expo? And were you worried that that might carry across negative consequence? Yeah. Um, you know, we were, we were concerned. I was very concerned. You know, I actually, um, I reached out to, um, several people that I trusted and respected, um, about their opinion, um, on the VTA. Uh, I spoke with Tony Abood himself. Um, you know, uh, we didn't go into it haphazardly. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, oh, the overwhelming, uh, response that I received from most everyone that I spoke to that was that VTA had the correct strategy for a unified industry moving forward, um, especially in protecting flavors and, and other tax um, regulatory taxes um, that might be coming down the line here and bans outright flavor bans that you see in, in states like uh, California and, and New York uh, right now. <clears throat> now James, so, James, you had turned around. You joined the VTA a while ago. I mean, as and for people that don't know, James Jarvis is the head of the Ohio Vapor Trade Association. You joined a while ago to the VTA. What was one of your first considerations when you said, "Yeah, I want to pull this trigger and make this happen"? When I when I first joined, I had uh, been doing an expo in Columbus. Actually, uh, it was my I think second one. Demetrius had came up to be a part of the advocacy panel. And we were talking obviously yeah, afterwards about, you know, larger advocacy efforts, trying to get Ohio to the next level. Uh, we had been an association for about two and a half years um, under the leadership of, of folks that have moved on to other positions. But uh, one of my, you know, talking to Demi and he gave me a lot of information about VTA and, you know, he said, well-educated, they've got the, fan, they got the strategy out there. They know what they're doing. We, you know, we really need to look at this organization. And so, after, you know, the next day, I think it was Sunday, um, 
I was asked to be a part of the board for OHVTA um, at that expo. We went around table to table, and I, at the end of it, I kind of sat back and talked to the current board that was there, and I told them, you know, this is the way we got to go. And if I'm going to put my 100% effort in this, this is the association that we need to join because they are the ones that have the track record so far, and they have the, the motivation, and they have the plan to go forward. And that's been – since 20, the end of 2016, um, it was about a month later, we joined VTA as OHVTA and then started in January, I was elected president of OHVTA. Um, it's just, it was the attitude that they brought forth. It was the knowledge, the professionalism, and they really had a great roadmap, if you will, of where they wanted to go at the time. And obviously things have changed year over year since then. And, and the FDA has gotten a little more stringent and now we've started to see flavor bans and, and tax attempts and everything else pop up and you know they've handled it very cool very calm very collected very professional you know they've taken their their time and actually analyzed what's going on to make sure that the response they give isn't too far one way or the other and they want to make sure they are putting both the stores the manufacturers and the consumers forward because if without those three elements this industry doesn't have anything wow uh Sherwin, you, sure, for the people that don't know, you are the president of the New York or the North Carolina Vapors Council, correct? Yes. Am I pronouncing that all correctly? Mm-hmm. Some of these acronyms that I'm, I've got to sit and I scratch my ass and I'm like, oh my God, am I going to remember all these? But <laughs> yeah, you just joined <laughs> recently. <laughs> you just joined recently, correct? correct. To the VTA. We did. Uh, we did it through the help uh, of Fig, who uh, did an amazing job uh, and Naked, working collectively <clears throat> and uh, bringing them into the VTA fold. Otherwise, you know, we're we're a great group, but we're, you know, small organization. You know, thirty five members based out of five hundred vape shops or in North Carolina. So with their help, we went ahead and we joined VTA, and we felt that you know that they did have the the best strategy moving forward on a federal level. Um, <clears throat> The fact that they were coordinating lobbyists together to have a, a common strategy or at least an update amongst the lobbyists was the first that I've ever heard of that that, is done, that has been done in this industry. Uh, they've submitted um, uh, paperwork to the FDA um, in regards to contracting third parties to, to uh, vindicate and elaborate on test studies and determine whether or not some of them were factual, some of them were non-factual. I mean, just uh, I mean, just stuff that that a professional trade organization needs to do. <clears throat> no trade organization is perfect. So if everyone out there is going, well, they do this, well, they do that. There's no such thing as perfection. And in, in my my organization is not per- perfect. VTA is not perfect. Other organizations are not perfect. But what you look for is who has the best chance of helping us get over these obstacles that we're going to see in 219, which is going to be T21, flavor bans, and taxes. And they're coming out in in droves even before these many of these assemblies have even started to, to, to start, have even opened for the year. So, I mean, we got a lot ahead of us. And, you know, VTA gave us a little bit of this, given us the confidence. I've spoken to Tony before. I know Tony. So, you know, we've, I've always had a good rapport with him. You know, I, I know Mark Anton. I like Mark Anton from Safada. He's a great guy. Me you know? too. Yep. You know, uh, I just felt that VTA was um was 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 what we needed. You know, and it's it's great for my lobbyists to hear what other lobbyists are going through. You know, um, it's also good to know that they're talking. It's also good to know that a lot of these lobbyists also have a lot of connections on the federal level that can help other states. You know, our Do lobbyist you- goes to Alec. Which is a I don't know, if you know that, but it's a it's a um, it's a it's a right wing convention policy convention, and uh, there's a lot of stuff that gets done there, and uh, he's he's heavily involved with that. Do you find so, that the I almost want to say a spider web work of lobbyists with your state lobbyists being able to connect with others on I would almost assume a little bit of an easier level. Is yeah. it going to have that a, a good impact? As in, if they see something that is happening right over at one state and happening wrong over another, they can connect with these people 
and come up with a better strategy. Yeah, I mean, we've we've been hit up because we were the first ones that that were unfortunately hit with a um, with an excise tax for vaping. North Carolina was one of the few. Um, we were not formed by that time, uh, but because of that, we were formed and we have helped defeat any increases ever since then at every at every year. And they've attempted to raise it. Um, but we've we've been contacted. They want to know a little bit about our excise tax, how it affects us, what kind of revenue. We're looking to the, the, the project. So these are questions that lobbyists speak to other lobbyists about, you know, just to get an idea, you know, um, you know how things move. Um, so, so it's definitely, I think, a, a, an essential part uh, and very indicative of a mature industry, at least getting there, uh, you know, on, on the political advocacy front on a federal level. I think there's a, a great degree of maturity and professionalism that we're starting to see. And, um, you know, it takes time. We're a young industry, you know, so it's and, and, and the longer that we have, the more the more the more mature, the more experience, the more money that these companies can contribute to the fight. So all in all, it's it's uh, it's productive. I've, I've been watching and I was amazed when I and I'll, I'll put it out there. I the fig. Ramsey is just an awesome individual in what he is trying to accomplish. I follow along in a lot of what he does. Um, He was the one that really started, even for me, for Tucson to be able to start to work with advocacy and try to put money back into states that I'm working with. Because I called him. and At first, I just sent him a little bit of a a chat text because I didn't know the guy. And all of a sudden, it turned into a full-blown conversation, very short time. And one of the most gracious people I've known, quick to irritate at times if you push his buttons, but funny as hell, you know, and a hell of a nice guy. But I've watched him go through all of these steps, bringing like naked 100 into helping these things happen. And I watch him do all these other things. And it makes me wonder at times, why are other larger companies not doing the same? You know, there are some out there that are that are truly helping, but... I look at the industry as a whole, and it makes me big, big letters of WTF. What what's really going on? Yeah, and, and you know what? It's it's gotten to the point. <laughs> Every state advocate uh, knows the same situation. We see shops that are doing well; they're not contributing, and you, and you wonder why. You know, and it's and it's it, you know it's it's gut wrenching. You know, Fig Fig feels it every time. Hundreds of manufacturers that he talks to, that he's trying to get on board. And after a while, it's very easy to lose your cool. You know, it's, you know, uh, advocacy, the big part of, of advocacy, ad- activism, whatever you want to call it, is patience, you know. But sometimes, man, that's why you got bourbon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's here, here, even in, I'm, I'm in a small, I'm not going to say a ho-dunk town, but I'm in one of the smaller towns in Northeast Ohio. And our local paper just this last Sunday ran a big front page story about teen vaping and all the crap that you're hearing from the FDA. And there is a local group on Facebook called Everything Cortland. And these people, you could tell, were just waiting to chomp at the bit to add whatever thoughts that they had. And the minute that I saw something come up, of course, I started responding with factual material, Royal College physicians, you know, Father Jack Kearney, all, all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And 30 minutes later, I was frustrated, tired, and pissed with some of the reactions that I was getting out of this. I'm not there trying to fight with you folks. I'm just trying to give you some different information. Yeah. And what I found is that these people were so ingrained in their bullshit thinking because they've been brainwashed by mass media, by Fox News, by everything that they see, that That's they it. think they know the truth and they don't. Uh, do you guys find that the same thing? I mean, Mark, you, you know, the carnival, do you see people walking around thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to walk in and see antifreeze sitting around? Well, you know, we, we, we find that a lot, you know, and the best way to fight bad information is accurate information, you know, and, and to do it in, in a way that, you know, they can receive, you know, not everyone is going to be able to, to receive information in the same way. 
Um, some people prefer, you know, long technical documents that, you know, list out every source and every, you know, cross reference for every statement. And some people um, need just need the bullet points, you know, and, and not at not no two people are created equally, you know, and you have to meet them where they are in order for them to receive the information correctly. Um, I would agree. So, you know, that that's part of what we do, you know, finding people where they are in communities where they live, um, listening to, to the things that they talk about. Um, I speak with Jennifer Smith Burton, you know, pretty frequently, not all the time, but yeah, I keep up with her and she lets me know about things that are coming down the pipeline and, you know, stuff that might be important. She's working on right now a program with uh, basically to educate the educators, um, which is a key, I think key and, and fundamental in what we're doing moving forward is to make sure that the people um, who are spreading information to our children, spreading information to other people in the community, that if they're educated and they're sending out the proper ed information, then, you know, it'll, it'll start making a bigger impact on, on, you know, bringing the, the, the gauge back down to, you know, five, I guess, you know, yep. I mean, at least like, let's have realistic conversations about, you know, what's real and what's not real and what's true and what's not true. Um, very, that's that's the start right there. It's a very good point. Um, James, uh, Lindsey Stroud here in the chat room brought up a point. And I know because you've been around on the Hill, you've been up uh, at the state capitol here in Ohio. Uh, she said Le legislators want bullet points. So yep. along with that, in Ohio, how do you combat things that you hear with truth and honest to God, there are times it makes me wonder how the hell do you do it without losing your cool sometimes? You see the gray hair that's starting? That's two years. Uh, <laughs> Dude, you, you ain't talking shit yet. Yeah. But I mean, honestly, uh, there's a, there's an old saying, and, and I think the legislators really kind of mimic this. Don't give me the birth pain, just give me the baby. You, they just want the facts as to what's going on. They want to know. They want to hear it from you. They want to hear it from their constituents, and they want to move on. Um, at the beginning of the year, for the last three years, I've made a post on my page, and it said, all right, let's get this out of the way because we're going to hear it. I mean, and basically it's because we're going to hear it over and over for the next three months. Popcorn lung, flavors and kids, underage vaping. It's just to a point where, you know, it's, it's ridiculous, and it's mind-numbing. So I made a post, it was about two weeks ago, I think it was, sat down at the computer and I said, well, time to do this again. So I sat down and I, I typed it all out. And then Kevin Crowley, God love him, got a hold of it. And everything that I had typed out, it was about 13 bullet points of, of what vaping is and isn't. Um, and Kevin took uh, the time to implant or to uh, put in links to everything that I was saying to back up the information. The Dr. K, the Dr. F study on popcorn lung. You know, the, there was three studies about nicotine not causing cancer. And I put that in there. Uh, and that thing, we shared it, and it's been around. I think I've looked at it the other day, and it's like 1,200 shares on just from that single post from other folks. And then Kevin sent it on his blog in the States and in the U.K., and it's really taken off. I used, something. Yeah, good. I used that very same thing in the Everything Cortland post, and I put in there, you people need to read this. It gets frustrating having to, to fight the same recycled bullshit stories that the ants put out there. The media takes it and, and runs with it, and then they always have to put background video of somebody chucking huge clouds behind it to really scare the people off and even coming into a vape shop. So we've already lost three-quarters of the battle before they even think about coming in to either, A, ask a question about what vaping is, or B, think about even making the switch all they see is you know the negativity and they see the clouds on the tv instead of you know an actual conversation most of the time sure when i'm going to ask you because you you belong to you and you're one of the head figures in the vaping legion and you have both the ability and the propensity to attack this from a very different angle and animal so when you when you come across these kinds of things how do 
you see, and it's it's odd because you are working both from the vapors point of view, but you're also working from the state level and from the group, the vapors legion, the vaping legion. How how do you attack these kinds of things? I mean, usually, <clears throat> usually when you see posts like that. We try to kill them with facts. You know, we try to get a whole bunch of people in there to go on in and comment on a particular issue. If someone drops a particular survey. You know, everyone needs to go in in there and comment on that survey. If there's a particular uh, uh, article where the, the ignorance there is just at mind blowing levels, you know, we'll go in there. And, and but it's it's you know you can't you can't get on that level. You, you know, we've, you know there, there was a time where there was complete savagery. And sometimes there still is a certain degree, but we also know, and I think we've gotten a little bit more refined, that when you deal with subjects like this in the general public, that you really do need to take the time and you need to have the facts that go along with it. You need to have personal testimonials, which go a tremendous amount, which a lot of us in the industry can't do. Uh, in, going in there with guns blazing don't, doesn't necessarily work. Going in there with facts, going in there with personal testimonials has a much better effect, and it's just a, 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 it's a question of numbers, you know, just you know, getting getting the army behind you and going in on a, on a particular issue. But if you look at some of the stuff that we're seeing today, I mean, a lot of you, I mean, should be old enough to remember back history-wise, reefer madness, right? You remember how reefer madness? Oh, they're smoking the reefer, you know, they're going, you know, they're going to have. You know, they're going to go to hell. So a lot of the stuff that we're seeing today is is the same kind of fear. You know, you know, uh, smoking marijuana will lead you to committing suicide. Smoking marijuana will go ahead. The same scenario is being done here. You look at where that industry is. It's a complete 180 from where it was before. You got to ask yourself why. What did they do differently when they had the cards stacked against them, when they were classified as a, as a Schedule One and still are, but yet they still were able to, to survive on a state level? And it boils down to taxes. It boils down to money. That's no what... government is going to go ahead and support an industry that they do not have a financial interest in, period. And this is where my controversial opinion on taxes come into play. All right. I'm, I'm going to ask, what is and why do you say it's a controversial? Because a lot of people, and rightfully so, believe that this industry is a, since it's a less harmful um, you know, product, uh, it is... Um, it doesn't. It doesn't need to be taxed because they're saving so much money, healthcare-wise, on a lot of the people that would be sicker if they were going ahead and smoking cigarettes. It doesn't work that way politically. In my personal opinion, this industry will have a better chance of survival if there was reasonable taxation placed on the product on a state level, and states would be more willing to fight for this industry if they had a financial investment in this industry. Now, there are some caveats to this. Obviously, you need to have a strong association and a strong advocacy group behind that state in order to go ahead and to get something like this done. But until we can go ahead and start generating the revenue that these states need or these states would like to see, a lot of them just don't have as much, I won't say interest, because there are a lot of politicians that will go ahead and believe in the product. But, I mean, you won't see that, that crowd of politicians saying this is a good thing, you know? The majority of the states that took up marijuana, they were all states that were financially in the red. Not anymore. That's, so that's, that's, that's an interesting point. Indiana, if I'm not mistaken, is now facing a taxation issue. And yeah. they, they lobbied hard. They, they've had a hard fight from day one with a lot of crappy legislation and a lot of shit that was going on. And now, now they're coming up to a taxation issue. And it makes me wonder, and I don't want to say capitulate, but if they were to work with the state in taxes, would they have an easier time? I think they would. 
Absolutely. Listen, I mean, every state is different. You know, there's some cards that states will play and some cards states won't play. In, a lot, in some states, T21 may be a card that they have to play because they're looking at a flavor ban. I don't believe in T21 and I'm not going to push it and I will fight it in my state because I can. And I'm sure there are other state groups that will do the exact same thing. But there's some state groups that are, are going to be having a, a more difficult time. The point is, is that there has to be something that has to motivate these states to say this industry needs to stay. You know? Yeah. Gentlemen, we've got somebody that actually is us utilizing the phone lines tonight. I'm going to open this up and see if I can actually get them to connect. This ought to be fun. Hi, 858. You're on the air with Vaping in the Mic. Who's this? 858, are you there? Maybe they're not there. <laughs> See, Dimitri runs into this issue all the time with phone lines. I've got this thing set up over here, and it's just cruising along. 858, I'll try you one more time. Back to what Sherwin was saying, you know, I mean, I think that it's so, you know, there's there's a difference between being philosophically opposed to, you know, taxation um, and and looking at it from a strategic, you know, kind of perspective yeah. like like Sherwin has done. Um, and just to be clear, I am not for taxes. Right. I don't want any taxes. But you've got to be we've got to be politically savvy, you know, in this industry. And, and, and we're starting to see it. You know, and some states will approach it, but I do believe that is going to be a major savior for a lot of states because now states have this. Have you ever heard of a state turning down money? Yeah, right. <laughs> Never. Never. Doesn't happen. No. So they go ahead and 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 now they've got a viable industry that they see growing, <clears throat> which could possibly maybe hopefully bring in more revenue than cigarettes which is ultimately the goal right they don't want that to go now we've got states and their legislators saying oh well you know i'm a democrat and i've got this program that's being funded by this tax revenue stream i got to support it you bring more people from different parts of the fold and that pushes it on a federal level as well and that's a big point i'm going to stop and ask just as a differing view and this is not to create any kind of a bullshit fight. James, sure. what are your thoughts on saying maybe a state should look at some minor taxation? Because I know, honest to God, for the longest time, the mantra of the vaping industry was no taxes, period. So from where we are in OHVTA, and there's a lot of conversation with, with our lobbyist, Charlotte, who's been our lobbyist for five years, um, we have been absolutely dead set against any kind of a tax, period. You know, we look at it as we are not tobacco. We are a, a option for, for people to, to get off of tobacco, and I think everybody else does too. Um, but we also know that there's there's been some very stern conversations within the House and the Senate that, you know, you're not going to be able to keep it – keep escaping a tax because you guys have beat it three times in four years – at some point in time, you're going to have to come to the table because we are going to get you. And it's to the point now where we need to have conversations of if they do tax us, what are we willing to accept? For one, two, the other caveat to that would be, okay, well, maybe not, maybe not a tax. Maybe it's a licensure bill. A licensure bill might push some of the, the bad actors out of the industry or out of the, out of the city. Um, folks that aren't really interested in it may may leave and it'll it'll bring some extra money into the coffers for the state but and i think that's really important because if they do make it a licensure bill where it's you know you have to be a vapor shop only or whatever it is to carry vapor i think that's going to get the consumers engaged again in advocacy because i think we've lost a lot of that piece over the last three years as we've seen vapor products you know liquids and, and larger devices go to tobacco shops they've gone into carryouts they've and that one-on-one -on -one interaction that we used to have with every customer that came in where we were able to sit down and talk to them about, hey, this tax is going on or there's this fight here. And they were engaged over the last two years as, as the industry's gotten bigger overall. We've seen the engagement with a lot of the consumers fall off. And I think that's strictly because they're not getting advocacy 
put in front of their face every time they go buy a bottle of liquid because they're not necessarily going to a shop. So I'm looking at it, at it, you know, they're going to their local gas station who just wants to sell them their twelve ninety nine liquid and their three dollar <clears throat> coil and get them out the door. They're not interested in talking about the rest of the story. So maybe it's not a tax piece, maybe it's a licensure bill or something along the line to start engagement back up between the consumers and the shops about what is going on legislatively in the state and in the federal from where I sit. But you know, it, it's something that we have to talk to the board about and or talk to the members about and see where they're at. But you know, it's up in the air. I don't I don't necessarily think it's gonna be a bad thing like Sherman said, as long as it's not something that's gonna be detrimental and push people away from this industry. And that's a big piece because a lot of people are looking at that taxation would become a detrimental thing. And I've got my own opinions on that, but I want to ask Mark, when you take Vapors Carnival to North Carolina, North Carolina has a per mill tax. Correct. At one point when I was looking at attending a show, we had to file, as a manufacturer, we had to file paperwork with the state to say anything that we sold we had to keep track of tax and make sure that we turned it in right how does that affect not only attendance by various manufacturers but how does that affect the expo in and of itself in Um, that state you know really most of the people in north carolina were already used to paying the tax anyway so it it wasn't really off-putting for any of the attendees um the business owners that that were that came to the event um, were accustomed to the North Carolina excise tax so it wasn't really off-putting for them um, for our exhibitors uh, it was kind of some somewhat off-putting to, to many of them because you know first you had to register um, as a tobacco manufacturer in the state of North Carolina um, you had to get a tobacco manufacturer's license and you had to file some forms uh, basically that identifies you with the uh, Department of Revenue. Um, and it is, as you said, a per mill uh, excise tax. So it's five cents per milliliter in the state of North Carolina. Um, our exhibitors were responsible for keeping track of uh, their inventory levels and what the beginning and end inventory levels were and for submitting a tax uh, to the state. And, you know, but that said um one of one of the things that uh that came about as a result of that um we've been working with uh the north carolina vaping council in sherwin and um and part of the fundamental importance of advocacy organizations and lobbyists and and protections for business owners like me in the state of north carolina is that they went and and argued on our behalf and and are potentially making changes to that for future um, uh, expos in North Carolina. So um, that won't be a requirement in the future. Right, Sherwin, mm-hmm. it's something like that. Yeah, well, I mean, our, we're in a position right now that we can, we can now pass legislation. So we're going to just have that amended very quickly so that um, if you're an out-of-state vendor, uh, you don't have to go ahead and, and file all those cr- that crazy paperwork you basically filed as an other tobacco product that's an otp license and then right. you file to go ahead and once you file that then you f- then you have to submit your excise tax so if you're if it's a, if, at a convention uh once this law gets passed that means that it, the paperwork wouldn't be filed it would be up to the convention itself to pay the excise tax so they would gather all the paperwork directly from the vendors the vendors would cut the check to carnival and carnival would cut the check just make it quick, so quick and easy. So, and it's been done before. It's been done in the boat industry here in North Carolina, so that shouldn't be a problem, uh, you know. And and, and, that's and again, the part of this is all about, yeah, that's the carrot. It, it, it's also creating relationships with the representatives, the General Assembly, and in the sun, you know, in the General Assembly, represent the representative side, the Senate side. And, you know, we've got some really great relationships. Our political action committee has donated to the re-election campaign. We deal with the chairmen of appropriate, uh, of, of, of multiple, uh, um, uh, multiple seats on both the House side and the Senate side. So, you know, we're, we're, we're doing extremely well as being able to be able to go ahead and, and actually write legislation. You know, eventually we'd like to go ahead and attack the, uh, the, the excise tax. 
because we feel that is, you know, unfairly burdensome, you know, to the open source system um, industry because it really doesn't put much of a tax burden on on the on the pod systems that have very little e liquid. So, you know, I know that in other states are looking at a, just a general sales tax, which I think is much more appropriate to be, ta- to be charged on the actual value of the product. You know, right. whether it's being a jewel, you know, which sells for what, 25 bucks or an e-liquid that sells for 25 bucks. It's more, it's more fair. It's more balanced, you know? Uh, so there are ways to go around about and do this, but you've got to have the relationships. You've got to uh, have, you know, the, 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 um, the acknowledgement from the politicians that your group represents your industry in a professional way and in a mature way and that's where that's where we come in that's where ohio comes in tennessee you know all every state that's got a that's got a group i mean when my lobbyist walks in they know he represents the vaping industry (laughs) very true All right, gentlemen, we're going to take just a short break here for a moment. We've got to take time to thank our sponsors at Smoke Crew Radio because without them, we could not do what we do. So I'm going to take just a minute, and we will be right back. Hey now, this is Dimitri with Smoke Free Radio reminding you to please show some love to our wonderful sponsors. Without them, there would be no Smoke Free Radio, and they are as follows. All the way from Florida, Moon Mountain Vapor with locations in Florida and their liquid available for wholesale and retail, moonmountainvapor.com. Some of the best custards and tobaccos on the market from the Brickwells Vaping Company. The lovely shell with a vapor bar. Locations in Texas, Virginia, and West Virginia. And of course online at thevaporbar.com. And who says you can't have award-winning e-liquid without cartoon characters? That's exactly what you're going to get at theplumeroom.com. And finally, of course, the Vaping Advocate magazine that has generously provided the telephone lines for you to communicate with us. Thank you for your support. And finally, for you, the listener, don't forget to check out the coupons and codes page on Smoke Free Radio. Pick up some e-liquid and save some money. From all of us here at Smoke Free Radio, thank you for your continued support. Hey, folks, P. Basardo here, and you're listening to Vaping and the Mic with Mike Peterson. For people that are tuning in just a little bit later this evening, I've got an excellent panel of gentlemen that have joined me. I've got Mark Bird from the Vapors Carnival. I've got James Jarvis from the Ohio Vapors Trade Association. I have Mr. Sherwin Mena from the North Carolina Vapors Council. And we're covering a lot of things that are going on. Um, We just got done talking about taxation, which brings me to another point. Um, We're looking at, and it's starting to pop up all over, and I'm curious how it affects you. The, the Tobacco 21, T21, and, and it's been here in Ohio. It, it just hit Cincinnati and was approved in Cincinnati. And that's like a major city here in Ohio. In Ohio, we've got uh, Dayton, Columbus, Cincinnati, Toledo, Cleveland. You know, those are the heavy five. And if one of them passes this garbage... We're looking at other ones that are probably going to try and do and follow suit. Hey, James, would you say that is true in Ohio? Are other places yeah, already starting to look really, at it? It really already started. Uh, the first city to go was Cleveland. Um, and then shortly after Cleveland, another small town went. Then they came to Columbus. 
and then Columbus passed, and, and obviously now they're down in Cincinnati, and that actually goes into effect in September. Um, the good news there is we've reached out to city council. I mean, they kind of passed that thing in, in roughly two weeks. It was bam, bam, and it was done. So uh, we've reached out, and we've uh, got some feedback from a couple of the members, and it only went down by one vote, I believe. Uh, so they wanted – a couple of the members that voted against us wanted us to come down and talk to them a little more. So we're going to try to get that done and maybe we can figure out a way to carve vapor out of it. I don't know. Uh, but we're going to try our damnedest. I know in Columbus, they had already made up their mind when it happened and Cleveland really, it just kind of came and went Akron, the same thing. I went to testify for Akron and they pretty much threw my testimony out because I didn't live in the city, even though I represented OHVTA and all of the cities that we have stores that are members in, they pretty much, dismissed me and said, you know, we'll take your testimony. And then the guy called me a liar uh, because I quoted the Royal College of Physicians and the Cancer Society statement. Um, so it was really interesting. <laughs> interesting wouldn't even cover half of that if somebody called me that. Uh, yeah. I would absolutely just blow a gasket. Sherwin, are you seeing the same thing in North Carolina area, or is it a little more subdued? No, well, it's going to get proposed for sure in North Carolina, but we'll be able to, we'll be able to defeat it. Um, you know, we're in the position to be able to do so. Um, it, but like, I, it, you know, it all depends on every state. Every state is different. You know, there, yeah. there might be some counties that might have some T21. We'll try and go ahead and fight that. It's hard, man. It's hard putting out these fires in these counties all over the place. I mean, we're worried yep. about state. And then you have these local boards of health that have all this autonomy to go ahead and pass these crazy laws. You know, I had a couple of people post uh, about the city that, doesn't allow vaping in public places and you know and uh uh but then if you went ahead and you re read it it's like well we're passing it but we're really not going to enforce it <laughs> kind of a, of an attitude what right? the hell yeah that yeah well th that has a lot to do with uh with sb uh 22 um you know the the uh, the law that caused a lot of controversy here in north carolina in regards to um same sex bathrooms. Remember that? Oh yeah. Yeah. Th so, so that started in North Carolina and it got the general assembly very upset and to the point where it said, listen, you go ahead and you do this. We'll strip all local authority for making these types of, of, of judgments. So when it's, so, so they, st these boards of health kind of tiptoe a lot around a lot of, they'll pass it, but they'll say, well, it's just to create awareness, you know, Right. So again, but every state is different, you know, and, and we, you know, with the help of our lobbyists, we put that fear of God in a lot of these municipalities. You know, there was one, in, there was one county that wanted to go ahead and, and uh, make it illegal to go ahead and, and uh, vape in, uh, in, in public, in, in the businesses, period. And we said that you do this, we'll go ahead and submit a bill that will pull all authority from all local boards of health. See, that's and that's, right. you mentioned. They came back. Yeah. They came, they came back and they were like, well, you know, we'll take a look at this later. <laughs> in Ohio, I mean, they knew there was – public health knew there was no chance in hell they were going to get a T21 statewide because that's something that would have to be voted on by the voters the way the Ohio law is written. And they're, they're not going to be able to do it. So the, the interest groups and the, the public health folks started hitting little cities one by one. And unfortunately for us, you know, Charlotte can't be in 88 counties and all 800 and some cities – to monitor it and it's just you know it starts steamrolling and once they got one it just kept going and going and going and so they don't have to worry about going to a t21 for a state when they can attack every small city and work their way up and, See, so and that's it's you hit on one key thing you know in a lot of that the one that stuck out to me was lobbyists and mm -hmm. people that are not aware it takes money to pay the lobbyist the way that that lobbyist is paid is from the state advocacy group. No store right. is going to afford or even take the time to pay a state lobbyist by themselves. It's not right. going to happen. Look at it. I mean, she's a state lobbyist. She's not a city lobbyist or a county lobbyist. There are some owns on the members that they have to subscribe to their local city council to get their, their city council notes. Um, they should be a member of the Chamber of Commerce so they could go to the meetings and really find out what's going on. There's absolutely no way one lobbyist can control an entire state the size of Ohio. Yeah, it's and very, very difficult. It's not fair, unfortunately, yeah. but life isn't fair. 
We're, we're very lucky because our lobbyist is also uh, a chairperson for his own city. Oh, so, like, yeah. So he also intermingles on on state, local, on local issues. So he knows all the mayors. He knows knows a lot of the council people and a lot of the bigger counties. So we've we've got an advantage here in North Carolina. So it, it works out. But still, it's tough. You know, yeah, stuff's gonna slip by. You know, yep. it's just a matter of fact, we can't be there everywhere. We gotta, we gotta pick our battles with the resources that we have, and if, they're thinning if, all if the, the people, time. The people that show up aren't in the big flocks that they were three years ago when there was a call to action either, which is something I touched on earlier. We've got to figure out how to reach the consumer again because it's so diverse anymore that they can buy product wherever, and they're not getting that interaction. Speaking That's of call to action. Sorry, uh, I just got a message uh, saying that uh, Tony is going to go live uh, on the VTA page tonight. So if you guys want to tune in, 9 p.m. Eastern time. Awesome. I, I, think, I think that's just the State Affairs page. Oh, is it? Yep. For the board oh. and the uh, for the boards and the association members. Oh, 10-4. Never mind. That's okay. <laughs> Mark, while you're up there, tell me. Um how does the T21 affect you as an expo? How does it affect the Vapors Carnival going from city, city, state to state? Um, well, you know, we have to keep an eye on it. It's definitely uh, something that's always on our radar. Um, whenever we go into a state, it's one of the one of the first questions that we ask the state organizations uh, that we go to is that um, we're um, basically what are the objectives that your state has? Um, what's going on, what's coming down the pipeline, what do we need to know about? Um, you know, uh, T21 is, you know, going to, you know, be coming to, I, I know North Carolina, I know, uh, Oklahoma. Um, I'm not sure, you know, whether, or not, you know, I'm pretty sure, or I'm confident that North Carolina, um, is going to, to kill, you know, any T21 legislation that, that comes down the line, but. Um, I, and I know that the vaping advocates of Oklahoma have a plan too, um, and they have a good team down there, and a bunch of people, you know, that that have been around for a, for a while. Um, so it's it, it's good stuff down there. And you know, as far as we're concerned, our objective um, in all of these places is to help other people meet their objective. Um, what is the state group objective? How can we help you accomplish that? What is, you know, this state group objective? How can we help accomplish that? Um, sometimes, you know, uh, groups are very active with us and participate very, um, you know, uh, immediately, like with North Carolina. I know me and Sherwin, um, we have a, a pretty tight relationship. I always, you know, ask him, you know, hey, you know, what about this? What about that? And I get the information um, from the horse's mouth rather than, you know, from Facebook. <laughs> Very much so. I'm I'm going to switch gears. Uh, I thought about talking about Jewel tonight, and you know what? That company just, it's a love-hate relationship all the way around. Uh, we could spend the next 16 days talking about things that are going on. But I have a different question because I've got, our group tonight is is diverse enough that I'm I'm curious as to your opinion. And we're going to talk about the HPHC documents that are going to be coming due for manufacturers of liquid. For me, it is an oddball kind of thing, you know, because we, we don't have all of the information that we need. What, what are the test needs? What are the costs associated with it? And, and we'll get to those hurdles, I'm guessing, as closer to as we come to November 8th when the deadline hits. But James from... The Ohio State Vapors Trade Association, how is that going to impact the R group, OHVTA? And what, how are you going to handle some of that? Well, we are kind of, at this point, we're, we're playing the waiting game with VTA. Um, I know they have a plan laid out that they are supposed to be meeting with the FDA about. Um, right now, you know, there's still, like you said, there's not guidance from the FDA per se, specifically on the HPHCs for vapor, but there is something out there for the PMTA and the, the tobacco piece. So we know 
what they had to test for. Um, you know, obviously, there's a lot of differences between ours. I know the FDA wants testing on every nicotine strength and every flavor. Why not? Why can't we just test the highest nicotine strength in that flavor? Um, I know that's something that VTA has on their plate. Um, also, I think they're going to talk about the amount of labs that are available to do the testing, which is not many. Uh, which is going to put a backlog on the industry trying to get done. And we couldn't really do it without direction unless we were going to guess based off of what tobacco wanted. So as far as OHVTA, we're kind of waiting on what VTA finds out. But I also know that Demetrius has some has some stuff set up for, for folks that he represents. And I've talked to him a little bit about those. And, you know, we're also going to look at that option and we'll present them both to our group and see which way folks want to go. But uh, I don't know that every company could afford to do it, you know, and that's going to be the unfortunate part that may that may eliminate half the people that we have in our association all across the United States or more. Uh, then you're going to see fire sales like never before. It's just really going to it could be disastrous to the entire industry. The closer we get to that date, if something's not changed. I've Anyone got some, was, I've uh, got some follow-up questions. All that, uh, sure. Mark. I'm going to hold you in reserve for the very last one. Um, yeah, Sherwin. How how is North Carolina looking at HPHC? <clears throat> uh, right now, I think the main thing is that VTA has something in place. Uh, we have a lot of small manufacturers in place in North Carolina, and VTA is coming out with a program that was uh, discussed at the conference. And we're going to be participating in that um, as soon as we get a little bit more information um, as to as to how they want to go ahead and proceed. Um, I think, well, I don't want to go into too much details, but um, but they, they have a very they've got a they've got a good program uh, for members. So if we can get in on that, then I think that'll save a lot of the e liquid manufacturers in North Carolina. Awesome. Because indiv individually, we have Enthalpy Labs here in, uh, in North Carolina, um, and they're, they're pretty big. But, but if you were to go ahead with them, the cost would be very high you know, on a per skew basis, which is what is required for this test. And uh, so, you know, we're, we're pretty much, you know, relying on VTA to kind of lead the way on this particular testing for at least the smaller manufacturers. Yep. Absolutely. It's it has been to this point for me as a small manufacturer, it has been only a, a cost of time to file everything correctly with the FDA, to get the labels done, to do these things. You know, some some small costs associated. But now we're looking at from my end, you know, thousands of dollars to get the testing done. But, Mark, here's my question for you concerning HPHC. Assuming, and I'm going to say just assuming, that it actually goes through and doesn't get pushed back, as an expo person, are you going to require proof that people have done HPHC before you let them in the expo? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's been part of, you know, uh, what we've tried to accomplish since the beginning. Of course, things change so frequently and so quickly that it's hard to keep up with the everything all the time. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we would require our, uh, if that were the, if that were to come into play, then we would require that of our exhibitors to show proof. Yeah. Do you expect a dramatic decrease in attendance by manufacturers at that point? Uh, maybe, but that's okay. I mean, <laughs> You know, from one aspect, I'm looking at it that the people that are doing it right, the strong will survive. That's and the right. people that are not doing it right or a fly by night or only in it for a cash grab, it's going to wash them out. Right. Well, one of the reasons, um, you know, uh, what I was going to say earlier, the reasons why we joined the VTA, another reason why we joined the VTA is because of that program that Sherwin was talking about. Um, it'll be of great value to. Um, our customers, our exhibitors, um, you know, and any members of the VTA who participate in that um, in that program that they're that they're talking about. Um, so that was another big reason why we decided to, you know, focus our our, our 
financial efforts on uh, the VTA as, from a national perspective um, is because they're going to be helping our customers, right? Very much so. Now, I'm going to pose a question, and, and then again, I'm going to go round robin to see what you guys think. We're looking at places that want to do flavor bans. And it has become a growing concern, I think, nationally, California being one of them. You know, they've, they've banned these flavors. They're, they're trying to... Even thinking about it pisses me off. But here's the thing. If this flavor ban role continues, what good is doing an HPHC going to do me as a small manufacturer? As in, if I'm seeing all of these other places banning flavors, why the fuck do I even want to think about doing these testings? James, how would you respond to that? I, I And I, I oddball question, it's just... No, it's not an oddball question. I mean, you, you, there's obviously, you got to look at yourself and look at the risk versus reward. How much are you willing to risk to continue to move forward and save lives in any way you can? And if there's something that doesn't work out and they end up you know, doing a flavor ban of some type, you've got to decide how long you're in it for. You know, you've got to go through with it, regardless of what you got to do. I mean, you can sit here and, and bitch and complain and moan all you want about it. You're not going to be around past November, regardless if you don't do it. And that's just point blank and it sucks because we could spend i don't know sixty thousand dollars doing hphcs in the very next week a flavor band could be thrown up in you know columbus <laughs> that would eliminate me from my you know four of my five stores and our lab in one swoop and that's that's kind of my fear you know, we're we're looking at gearing up and getting these things done. And no, I can't manage to put all of our flavors that we have through an HPHC process, but we're going to get some of our, our better ones done so that we can at least remain on the market. Okay. Sherwin, what are your thoughts about that? No, it's a very it's a very valid question. Um I think you you also have to look and I'm sure that James has plenty of experience with this, that politicians ask for the world on uh, all of these bills. Yep. Just because you have, you know, 12, 20, 100 that are being proposed, a very small amount actually go ahead and make it through. The ones that go ahead and create traction are obviously ones that can be negotiated. So obviously a flavor ban is something that we don't want to have in this industry. If you've got a good lobbyist and a good state advocacy group, you know, you can pull some of those cards those aces that you have in your back pocket like taxes and t21 to kind of get rid of those flavors again I, i'm not an advocate for any of those things you know but i i especially for t21 but there are things that you can do um do i believe that that it makes sense to go ahead and do an hphc if your state has done a flavor ban it depends on 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 and what kind of manufacturing facility do you go ahead and ship just, you know, within your state or do you, you know, 50 statewide, you know, so there are some extenuating circumstances, but for the small manufacturers, yeah, it makes absolutely no sense. You know, why would you want to do that? You know, I've got a nice, you know, uh, in-house brand, you know, GMP production methodology lab, it's clean, you know, uh, if I got a flavor ban, I wouldn't do an HPHC, it wouldn't make any sense for me. I'd have to bring in bring in other brands that I know that are more reliable. So you know, we just got to understand that you know that, that there is no black and white in this right. area of politics that we are working in. This is all about perception. It's all about backdoor deals. It's all about give and take, and it's all about making someone look good or making someone not look as if they're losing, which is a big part of it too. Yep. You know? So you know, very easy. I remember politician went ahead he wanted to pass um funding for us for for uh e-cigarette education here in north carolina and uh, to make a long story short it got passed but at the very last second we defunded it but we let it pass but it made him look good look what i got yeah well he didn't get enough money to fund it but it made him look good that he got his bill passed 
He was he was pissed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you, man, you gotta have a fucking killer as a lobbyist. You really yeah, you, do. you have to have a killer. Nice yep. guys don't, you know, hey, how are you? No. Like I'm gonna eat you for fucking lunch if you don't look at me. You know, that's absolutely <laughs> that's that's what you need. Yep. It, it is, and the, and the strength of the lobbyist too. When that lobbyist walks in, not only does he represent your industry, but I'm sure he also represents a whole bunch of other industries. And if he's a good lobbyist, he'll leverage those other industries to push your agenda as well, which is mm-hmm. another strength of a good lobbyist. Yep, ours actually got us involved in what we call the Tobacco Coalition. Mm-hmm. It's about 21 other organizations like ours that all have something to do with either tobacco or vapor. So the, the convenience petroleum folks, the um, wholesalers association, the, uh, I think Reynolds is one of them. I think blues in on it. Uh, we're in, there's 21 different companies or organizations and we all fight for the same thing, which has been nice. And we're not throwing anybody under the bus. We're stating where we need to be. You know what I mean? And they've been very supportive of us, and we've been supportive of them. It's worked fantastically. Mark, have you seen a lot of questions or a lot of people or a lot of, uh, even with this upcoming expo, have have you seen concern about HPHC? Has anybody even really mentioned it, about uh, what the future looks like? No, absolutely. We've had, you know, um, uh, a lot of... Uh, a, a lot of our customers are, are struggling financially because they're preparing for a, uh, the HPC testing and stuff. And, um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, what, nothing happens in a vacuum, you know, if, if it's affecting one person in this community, if it's affecting one manufacturer in this community, it's going to affect all of us. So, you know, you know, we got to take it, you know, we've got to start small in my opinion, you know, we've got to get back to the roots, the grassroots foundation level stuff. You know, we've, we've got to start networking and moving the needle on public image. We've got to start talking to people who aren't vapors, who aren't vape business owners, who, you know, we, we, we can't just keep focusing within, you know, our own industry, you know, and expect to, to, to move the needle on, you know, smokers, <laughs> you know, we just can't, you know, we're talking business stuff, but how, you know, the, the real question is how is all of this stuff going to affect smokers who want to transition? And and that fuels my, my answers every time. Um, how, you know, what do I think is the best is going to end up being the best outcome for smokers. That's why another reason why we joined the VTA, you know, their flavor bands and their strategy on, you know, how they're going to protect flavor in, in the United States um, specifically, you know, is, is important, you know, without that, I think that we're going to see a lot more people dying from smoking, um, as, as people stop, you know, vaping, you know, because most of the people that I've spoken to personally have said that if they don't have flavored tobacco, the chances are, they don't have flavored e-liquid, then chances of them going back to tobacco are, you know, about 80%, 90% (laughs) certain. So, you know, what are we in it? What what are we in it for? You yeah. know, I mean, to look at example global warming. You think that would be a very easy issue for a lot of people, but politically, it's a mess. Right. <laughs> All right. Mm-hmm. Why is it a mess? Is it a mess because because we it, it could not be wrong? I don't. I, you know, I believe that we are that global warming is a result of, of, of mankind and what we're and our productivity here. But politically, on the hill, it's getting a roadblock right. why why because it all boils down unfortunately to to money to large corporations to dollars to money to money to money it is that is where, that is where that, uh, that's why my controversial issue on taxes will keep going until until the industry fucking hears it and understands that we need to have the state on our side 
so that they can be more reliant on this industry and on the revenue that it produces. The more time that we have, the more money the states will get, the more interest they will have in keeping this industry alive, just out of self-preservation for themselves and the funding. And God knows how many programs, you know, but we're in, now that state advocacy groups are in a position to be able to go ahead and, and, and talk about this, you know, we'll be able to negotiate better terms than what North Carolina had. You know, I'm trying to get to get it renegotiated, but it's difficult. Once it's in there, it's in there. It ain't coming out. It's not coming out. And to go ahead and try and change it is like a, more paperwork, more different people. You know, it, it would affect a lot of people. The only they want to see, yeah, they the only, see how it's going to make them more money. <laughs> exactly. The only way it would possibly change is if you propose something where it, where it generated them more money, which I believe the sales tax probably would because it would then go ahead and, and tax you know, pod systems just as much as it would open source systems. Yeah, as long as they don't go fucking ape shit overboard. Yeah, yeah um, no, no, right. no. But the, but but that is that's the main thing here. Is, is we need to have we need to have that state reliant on our tit. You know, we yes. otherwise yep. they have no interest in going ahead in 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 fighting for this industry other than a couple of good politicians who understand that this is a life saving product, and there are some constituents behind it that you know may may have some proactive action on their part come election time. And that's so, a big you know, one. Throw the dollar prison in there, it changes the entire, it changes the spectrum all, all together, you know? I'm going to throw a real zinger in here right now. Zing. Yeah. Zinger. This, this one has been on my mind now for a little while. Ian Firth, love the man to death, made a re- or a response he replied to something in a group and i'm going to read this to you it said failing to register had zero repercussions and this is going back to 2016 it said failing to use child resistant closures had zero repercussion failure to place the correct warnings on your products had zero repercussion Failure to file health documents had zero repercussions. Failure to file ingredient listings had zero repercussions. And he said HPHC will be no different. How would you respond to that, James? I mean, he's got a lot of valid points. Uh, you know, the, the problem comes. Why, why would you want to risk it? You know, if you're doing things right, you continue to, to keep going through the stupid fucking hurdles that they throw out there for us. Why would you all of a sudden just not want to do it? I mean, you've got to have integrity in this industry. You've got to have, have integrity for your for your customers. Why would you risk that? But then the other side of it, there's all these jackasses out there. Like every other day, flavor of the day is coming out and, and somebody else's new liquid. Or in a new friggin' salt nick that didn't exist two weeks ago. They don't give a shit. Well, if they get caught, big deal. It comes off the market. They've already made their money. They don't give a crap. Yep. Well, you it'll know? make a big deal when they start, when they become large enough to matter. I mean, it's just like yep. your taxes. You know, I didn't file my taxes last year and nothing happened. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to file this year. Maybe nothing will happen. But sooner or later, you know, it's going to happen. They're going to look for that money. They're going to want to find out if you paid your dues, period. Right. I mean, you look at what happened as soon as they, they published Candy King and, and Juice in the Box, whatever the hell it was, all of a sudden, bam, exactly. everybody puts their label. So, I mean, as much as we want to say they haven't really been enforcing or there have been repercussions, there have. They're just not out there in front like we've seen them, I guess you would say. They're out there, and they have made the industry change a lot. Sherwin, how would you reply to that? Um, we Our industry deals in the realm of public health, and I think we have to go ahead and be held to those same types of standards. Uh, we already have a target on our back. We don't need more. The fact that there's no repercussions doesn't mean that it can't be made an issue later. So as James said, why do we even risk it? Just do it. If you can't do it, then it's time to leave. You know, the, it, the, the, the herd is going to get thinned out regardless, and it has continued to be thinned out. So this will just go ahead and get rid of those that who are truly committed to this product. 
and have the financial wherewithal here and overseas to go ahead and manufacture this product and we'll do it for the long term. And those that stay will make millions and millions of dollars. And those that don't, I don't know, they'll do something else. They'll do they'll load CBD, you know. I, I've looked at this in several different fashions. And what I've looked at is while I understand and agree with Ian in his reply that there have been no repercussions from the FDA or very little, you know, and, and I'm looking at, you've got guys that are breaking the law. The industry knows these people are breaking the law. The industry itself can't do shit about it because we have no enforcement capability ourselves except this one. When we say there's no repercussion, how many stores do you guys think will actually go have you filed your HPHC? And if you have not, we're not going to buy your product. That's the biggest piece of enforcement that I can think that might happen. Do you believe that may come to pass or are stores going to continue to go, eh, go fuck yourself and, and just be a cash grab? Well, look at the mass hysteria that surrounded um, GCCs. As soon as we figured out we had to have those, the entire industry lost its ship. And you know, GCCs became more common than what strength of nicotine do you want? And people weren't letting liquids in unless they had their GCCs, at least where we are anyways. And I know it happened across other states. You know, and yeah. then you, you – go ahead. No, no. You're, no, you're right. I mean, I mean, the, the purpose of, our, of a state association is to guide our members. Yep. And, and we'll be able to go ahead and tell them how to do the right things to survive this – to make sure that they're in compliance and they'll be doing it right while the other ones will be leaving. And there's, I'm sure that James, you hear it all the time. The shop across from mine is doing some funky stuff. They're not charging mm -hmm. tax, selling to minors. They're undercutting me like crazy. You know, those yep. are the guys, those are the guys that are going to go. Exactly. You know, and good reason. Stations are the ones that, that, that will have the knowledge behind them. So in case anything does happen, They'll be, be able to call on us, our lobbyists, or at least we'll have the, the compliance needed to stay in business. Yep. You know, and, so and if you're if you're running a great association like, you know, like Sherman, the members are going to ask you the question. And I, if I answered, if I answered the question about GCCs and CRCCs one time in that 24 hour period, it was probably 110. Because every single person wanted to know what was going on with them. And the same thing with building up to the um, registration and now going into the HPHCs. I've probably had, out of our 135 members, I've probably had 75 ask me what's going on with them. And I've also had just as many ask me where they can go research to find out if one of their companies has registered. So it's getting through to the people that are doing it right and following a direction that's out there it's the the bad actors and I, my wife hates when i use that word it's the bad actors out there that are going to be the ones that have to answer in the end and we need to keep our heads down keep moving forward keep following the timelines that we have keep acting responsibly and keep holding our vendors accountable to do the same thing yeah you know one one of the things that we're proud of saying is that you know no no shop in North Carolina that's a member of NCBC has ever been cited for anything, you know? So the, 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 there's a reason for that because they know what's going on. They know what's right. They know what's wrong. You know, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's, 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 it, it's essential in order to go ahead. If you want to conduct business in this industry, you need to, you need to be part of an association that will guide you to make sure that you're making the right decisions and you're knowledgeable about the regulations that are, that are coming forward. And that's what every association does. And, you know, you know, are there no repercussions? We don't know that. But the point is, is that if something bad happens in North Carolina, I can go to my lobbyist and say, it wasn't one of our guys. <laughs> right. And that's important. <laughs> Massively yeah. important. And All right. We've sent out direction that we've, we've educated them. Hey, when, when, it, when an inspector come in, comes in, don't be standoffish. <laughs> don't challenge them. Welcome them in. Walk them around, ask ask them how you can help them, and let them do their job. And if they yeah. give you something to do, follow up on it and take care of it. And communicate to the other 134 members that are in the association, hey, FDA inspector's out running around. Make sure you got everything ready. Mm -hmm. 
communication is so Absolutely. important. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They came in. If they came in and we found out from one of the shops that they wanted GCCs, FDA is around. Make sure you got your GCCs ready and available. Boom. 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 They all got hit. They all had their GCCs. Everything was fine. Yep. All right, gentlemen. As we get ready to wrap up, uh, kind of last comments. James, what would you want people to know? Honestly, um, it's going to be a rough year for all of us in every state. Uh, we need to not bury our heads in the sand. We need to, to pick our heads up. We need to make sure that we are following our state association. If you're a consumer, make sure you're following CASA. Make sure you're following your state association. If you're a business, you need to be a member and also attend conference calls that are out there monthly. Make sure you pay your association fees and don't let them go above and beyond being late and then accidentally forget about them because those funds are earmarked for certain things. And if you don't have, you can't afford that lobbyist, they're not going to say, yeah, I just make my payment thousand dollars less this month. <coughs> they're fighting for you. They want to make sure that they're getting paid. But if we don't put our hands in the, in the you know, put our heads in the sand and we keep moving forward, we keep working together. We keep communicating and we keep getting active and interacting with each other, we're going to be able to beat anything that's thrown at us. But awesome. if we don't do those things, it's going to be a worse year than we've ever had. And then on top of that, if you're not bringing a new a smoker into this industry to help them better their life, please do that and also educate them. And if you're anywhere around Oklahoma, get your ass to Vapor's Carnival next weekend because we will all be there. Well, I know I'll be there. I know Mark will be there. That's right. Um, I don't know, Sherman, if you're going to be there or not, but uh, no, I won't be there. It's, it's going to be an amazing, amazing time, an amazing opportunity to get back to doing what we started doing six years ago in, in my stores, helping convert smokers. There's nothing better than taking a smoker and showing them, you know, an Endura T18, a bottle of 50-50 liquid, explaining to them how to change their coil, explaining to them how to maintenance their device, and watching them come in the next week then two weeks later coming in and stepping down nicotine and then a year later coming in and going man i'm off i'm done thank you that is the greatest thing they could ever do to us i would agree sherwin what kind of last thoughts have you got for folks uh i think for the first time uh everyone who um is either listening or will listen to the show just realize that for the first time we've got a uh, legitimate federal organization that is coordinating on the state level to fight a lot of these things. And they're also fighting in states that don't even have states, state associations. So stay positive. There's going to be a lot of bad stuff coming up this year, but just do realize that we are fighting to make sure that a lot of this stuff does not pass. T21 is obviously one of them. You know, we don't want to have T21 ethically. I don't want to have T21. I think I'm pretty sure that VTA's policy is that they don't believe in T21 as well. You know, um, I think uh, in Virginia, Altria just submitted a bill for T21, from what I heard. Um, a bunch of scumbags. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> but, but so yeah, but don't freak out. You know, a lot of bad things. But stay informed, reach out to your state association, read out, reach out to your advocates, find out what you can do. If there's a meeting, go to it. But above all, don't lose hope. But the first time we're organized, we've got a, a, a statewide plan. And I do believe that we will survive this year and we will have a lot of victories. Fantastic. Thank you. Mark, what have you got to wrap up with? You know, I just want to agree, you know, say that, you know, I appreciate everybody for, you know, coming in and supporting the carnival and, you know, and what we're about and what we're going to be, you know, continuing to do in 2019 and beyond. Uh, you know, the, you know, if I had any suggestion or if, if, you know, if I had anything to say, talk to people that aren't in the vape industry, you know, um, spread the message to people who 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 aren't in the industry because the information needs to get out and be disseminated by people you know that you know don't already have this information you know we keep recycling this information around you know other vapors and other vape business owners and everything and you know how effective is that <laughs> you know 
we need to get this message out to, to people who, who, who aren't on social media, maybe, you know, who aren't, you know, necessarily, you know, in a vape shop or, you know, in a, in, you know, whatever, you know, we've got to reach these people somehow and give them accurate information where they live. You know, that's what I, that's, that's the only thing that I got to say. Fantastic. Gentlemen, I seriously appreciate you taking time this evening, especially at the last minute, pulling together, uh, to come online, stop and talk about a few things. Hopefully people that are watching, listening, otherwise might grab some new information or have a different outlook on the vaping industry and what we're trying to accomplish. So I appreciate you guys stopping in very seriously. So yeah, thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it for everybody else that is out there, both on smoke free radio through speaker whether you are listening, watching, however, I will catch everybody again coming up next week on another edition of Vaping in the Mic.